We sometimes think of Haddington in the past as a rather sleepy market town. But step back to last century, and you'll be surprised at just how busy this town was. The din of metalworking at Rose Hall Foundry. The scaling of Kilspindy when the streets were full of factory workers hurrying home. The chink of bottles at the Nungate. The repetitive rhythm of the courier press on print nights, which seemed to shake the building itself. And the smells, some of them not so pleasant, the skin works. Some of them more so, more pleasant. The brewery, the maltings, and the aroma of fresh bread in the morning. We're going to look at some of these vanished industries and businesses of Haddington. And wherever possible, the story will be told by former workers. It's fitting that we start with seed merchants. Seeds, after all, are the beginning of all life. Haddington had two seed merchants, both with long pedigrees. Roughhead and Park, which dates from 1755, and Dodds, which was founded in 1782. Dodds are still with us, but a little way outside town now. Between them, these companies provided farmers with quality seed, which helped to make East Lothian one of the richest agricultural areas in Scotland. And their customers were south of the border too, and as far north as Aberdeen. What kind of seed? Grass seed. Townies like me might not think of grass as a crop, but of course it is. And the grass seed they provided was not just any grass seed, it was special mixtures, mixtures tailored to particular conditions and even to individual farms. When we look at the seed catalogues, we find these astonishing names of grasses, giant Italian, Danish Coxfoot, New Zealand Wild White, and others. Roughhead and Park, on this site, the John Gray Centre, had their own seed loft, and here some of these seed mixtures were put together. Their rivals, Dodds, were just across the road in Court Street. At one time, the Royal Bank of Scotland was the Dodds family home. I started working with Rough Head and Park in 1963. 1954. In 1960. Well, I left school in 1963 at the age of 15 years, and two weeks later began work at Rough Head and Park as a trainee seaman. We started off as a partnership, and of which I, a partnership was William Dodds and Son, and we became Dodds of Haddington Limited which obviously entailed directors and these kinds of things. The early years with Roughhead and Park were taken over, or were part of United Seeds, which then became Sinclair McGill, it was finally taken over with ICI Seeds, and I worked right through that passage um, for about 27 years. The work entailed uh, initially unloading the lorries, the uh, seed would come mostly in 100 weight bags, sometimes 12 stone. It could even be 16 stone if it was clover or alcide, which was heavy, but mostly 100 weight bags. Taking them in, storing them here, laterally mixing them up in the spring for the farmer, and then loading them back onto a lorry when it was ready mixed. That was basically the job that was entailed. When I started, there was actually a thing called Seed Merchant's Apprentice, or Seedsman's Apprenticeships, which usually lasted for about four years, which entailed uh, warehouse work, field work, and um, seed testing and that kind of thing. And um, that's how it started. The first job I got when I started here was a lorry drew in with white clover from down Kent. Uh, each bag with 300 weight. They had to be carried in and put in down the stair, even got a steps plan. That was the first job they started at Redden Park. When we first started, it was basically mixing of grass seeds, uh, weighing out of root seeds to the farmers, which was a big thing in these days for fodder for animals. And um, 
basically that that, that was what it was. Um, summertime, uh, after the most of the grass seed had passed, we used to work with the root seeds, go out onto farm in the autumn and, and select root seeds. And they were planted in our trial grounds within the area. And these were harvested. And uh, that was our stock seed for the next two or three seasons. So that was one of the ongoing things which happened in the late summer. In the springtime, we got all the casual workers in to help us with the orders and so forth. There was always a lot of characters amongst them. Um, but Peter's ship was down the stair, would have about three men and about three or four women also. Up in the middle of which was Joe Davison, which I worked with, would be about four, would be four men plus about three women. This was all part of the, the cohesion going forward, the plan. As far as seeds are concerned, we started off in herbage seeds very much entirely and then as grain came more and more important and, the, and the farmers started buying their grain rather than saving their own seed, that became a very big important part of our business and um, we, that became far and away the biggest part. And of course that's why we had to move out of Haddington because the premises here just weren't big enough. In this building, the seed that we dealt with was uh, mostly grass seed, ryegrass, clover, alsike, uh, which was for grazing, silage. For grass seed, uh, grain was actually sorted out down in Sidegate at the branch down there. Well, we moved away, um, I would say, from the traditional seed merchant's job of selecting your own uh, root seeds and uh, it was more specialised in the cereal seeds um, grass seed to an extent uh, as well. When I first came here you would hardly believe it but every bag that went out of Rough Eden Park was labelled and one, one chappie, an ex-policeman, used to write all these labels out and as time went on the frosts were all tight and so forth but he used to write every label out with hand Ink and a good writer too. Bob Morris was his name. The biggest change was the pure volume of seeds handled during the, during a, a period of a year. But uh, now, very very much more than when I first started. We got um, a plant in on the middle floor here, which um, mixed the seed up instead of getting mixed on the floor. It was mixed on the so that did away with a couple of men. Um, but they still had women for to sew the bags up. They, it was much cleaner. But this time, instead of involving two floors, which it did in the past, it involved three floors because you have to have the chap that was on the middle floor moved up to the top. And he, the order was carried on from the bottom right up to the very top and then transferred to the middle, which, was, which I finished up doing on the middle floor at that time, about 56, 57. Oh. Quite often farmers will save their own seed, um, but coming to a recognised seed merchant with a good reputation, it was guaranteed of getting purity, uh, seed of good germination, which was vitally important. And uh, in the early days, there was a lot of uh, farmers saved their own seed. And for 10 years, I actually went up into Caithness and some of the farmers up there would be keeping seed out for as much as 10 years. And the interesting thing was that with, in the case of oats, um, it was very irregular after it was grown on the farm for a number of years. And also the new seed that we used to put up from the Lothians would be a good week to 10 days earlier than what had been grown on constantly in Caithness. So that's quite interesting. We're going to look now at three of the ancient trades of Haddington, milling, brewing and baking. We know that there were flour mills in Haddington from the early Middle Ages at least. The mills were burnt by the English in 1330, along with the town. The nuns of St Mary's convent at Abbey Mill just across the river derived income from the mills. When we look at the council records, we find that Haddington had two flour mills. There was one at West Mill and the other 
here at the Poldrate is East Mill. And the buildings around me probably date from about a rebuild of 1842, although there is medieval masonry in the structure. So they are something of a jigsaw. When the mills were sold by the town council in 1894, when the, West, the East Mill here was sold in 1894, it was described as a flour, barley, and corn mill. But it also produced malt for the local brewers. And that was sold at a fixed price, fixed by the town council. In the 1940s, this was known as Templeton's Mill. And George Angus remembers in the 50s that there was still a wooden sign on the second floor advertising shepherd oats. The last owner was W. Morrison and Company. They produced poultry and animal feed. The mill went out of business in the 60s, and in the late 1960s, it was bought by the Lamp of Lothian Trust. It's a, it's a great sort of link to the, heritage, the agricultural heritage of the county. And uh, uh, the trust in 67 set out to sort of preserve these sort of buildings and put them back to use after the milling stopped here in the 60s. Um, the buildings are now used as, uh, for community use uh, and a mixture of arts and crafts groups and community groups. Uh, the ground floors are pottery for the uh, pottery arts and crafts. Uh, the first floor is used by uh, uh, upholsterers and spinners and weavers. And the top floor is used by the Bridge Centre Motorcycle Club. The granary uh, on the various floors is used as, uh, mostly as art studios for painters, woodworkers and uh, craftspeople. Uh, and that was very much part of the Duchess's uh, uh, vision, was to sort of develop this uh, community spirit and the creative life of the, of the, the, the locality. The, the, the last company to operate it was uh, a, a local farmer, Courtney Morrison, uh, whose son is uh, Sir Garth Morrison, still farms in the county, as, in, as indeed the county's Lord Lieutenant and chairman of the Lamp of Lothian Trust. So there was milling he, uh, happening here right up until the 1960s. Uh, last, uh, two years ago, East Lothian Council gave us a grant towards restoring the mill wheel. So it's now actually operational again when there's sufficient water in the lade. During the week, uh, it can be rather busy. Um, you know, in the morning you can find a whole class of uh, uh, ladies sitting around down spinning and weaving, uh, making some wonderful uh, uh, woolen goods. Uh, and of an evening you can pass by and see the lights on in the pottery and look in, uh, and people are, are busy at the potter's wheels. Like milling, brewing is one of the oldest trades in Haddington. Beer and bread were staples of life in early times. In fact, small ale, that's low alcohol beer, probably about 2% at most, was a safer drink than water. I think people were a lot more cheerful in these days. We're here to learn about the last of the Haddington breweries, the Nungate Brewery, sometimes called Binney's Brewery. Well, there were certainly 14 commercial breweries, seven maltings and three distilleries that have existed over the last uh, almost 300 years. And of course, uh, on this very site uh, was the last of the breweries, which is Mark Binney's new Nungate brewery, there having been two breweries previously in the Nungate itself. And the rest of the breweries were all at various sites within Harrington. Mark Binney trained as a brewer and maltster at Thompson and Morrison's Brewery in the Canongate area of Edinburgh. And Thompson and Morrison's partnership dissolved and Mark Binney left soon afterwards and he continued uh, his experience as a brewer at Bishop Middleton in uh, County Durham. And he was down in England for approximately 10 years and uh, he obviously, that, that experience put him in very good stead for coming back to his home county and uh, setting up a completely new brewery in the Nungate. And it seemed to flourish quite quickly 
And in the 1880s, he took great pride in building uh, an aerated water factory as part of the site. And he was quite proud of that. And in most of his advertisements, uh, he always slipped in that he had this aerated water plant and he was quite proud of the various uh, fizzy soft drinks that he made at the time. The brewery itself um, was on a relatively small scale and probably the number of employees numbered around a dozen including uh, draymen and various women who would carry out bottle washing tasks. Officially to, to start a brewery as such you needed a license from the local authority but um, it was fairly easy to get a license you know, to operate a brewery or a maltings for that matter. And uh, it wouldn't have been much of a problem. Predominantly it was bulk beer, but he used to advertise beer for sale in wood and bottle. And that so many of his bottles have survived, which would suggest there was quite a production of bottled beer sold locally, but a lot of the bulk beer was sold in the northeast of England because Newcastle was famous for having pubs that ran out of beer. So the Edinburgh breweries as well as the Haddington breweries used to regularly supply the northeast of England market. And that was important to Mark Binney. Bottled beer certainly was supplied to um, licensed grocers and quite an assortment of public houses locally and there were certainly uh, bulk beer supplies uh, supplied to local pubs and he used to advertise porter and various ales. Pale ale was particularly popular at that time and Mark Binney made a variety of pale ales including India pale ale, sparkling pale ale and lightly hopped pale ales and mild ales, they were particularly popular locally, the low gravity beers. Mark Binney had established his brewery and it was completed on the site in 1882 and the brewery continued until July 1936. At that time, it was sold to Burns Colston who had the tannery next door. Near the brewery, was Starks the Joiners, and George Wark has a story for us about one of their employees. I was a joiner and cabinet maker undertaker with the local builder and the undertaker James Stark. Right, and were there premises near here? Just down the road, St Martin's Gate. I've heard they had a rather famous apprentice at one time. Yeah, we did have, a, I can vaguely recall him, a, a rather, a, just come out of the Navy, I believe, and, and he was a, a, to take up acting, but mm -hmm. a, he worked with us for some time, mm -hmm. in the name of Sean Connery. Sean Connery, of course. And what did he do? He helped with the staining and polish of the coffins, mm -hmm. with two other ladies. We made them and passed them across to his department. And you told me about an initiation ceremony they had for the apprentices. Well, normally when you're initiated with a new company, there is an, an initiation ceremony. They grab you quite roughly, put you in a coffin, screw the lid down, and you're left there for 15, 20 minutes, and you were told to be quiet in case the boss heard. <laughs> a bit dark in there, was it? Rather. Yeah. <laughs> and very uncomfortable. Bakers, Baxters and Scots, are one of the nine trades of Haddington. Each of the nine trades had its own pews in St Mary's Kirk. I'm standing outside what was once the bakery and tea room of Charles Laidlong. He started the business in 1928 when he bought the business of Daniel Stott. He soon acquired the property next door. This was a very ancient property, the King's Arm Inn. It was once a coaching inn, and from here, coaches left for Edinburgh. 
it's strange to think of stagecoaches rattling their way up the hard gate. He cleared the site and built a new bakery, tea room, a three bedroom house and kitchen that we can see today. It was built by Bailey, a well-known Haddington builder. The business did well. He bought a van in 1929 to service the surrounding villages. And that van, the coachwork, was made by Kennedy's of Haddington, another of the lost industries of Haddington. He bought another in the 1930s and a third after the war in 1948. At its peak in the 1950s, Laidlaw's employed six bakers, a confectioner, a pie shell lady for the famous Laidlaw pies, three tea shop ladies, and three to serve in the tea room above. The tea room was well known. It was enjoyed by Haddingtonians and visitors alike. My father used to eat here on his visits to Haddington. For one shilling and ten pence, you could enjoy a three-course meal, all cooked by Mr. Laidlaw himself. The tea room closed in 1958, and in 1960, Charles Laidlaw died. The business was continued by his widow and by his son, Kenneth, until 1973. If you knew where to look, you could still enjoy a Laidlaw's pie up until 2002. And now, a business which was all about selling the past, Leslie and Leslie, the auctioneers. We're in Kilpare Street, where the famous Leslie and Leslie sales took place, the lane sales. Incidentally, there's a curious survival of the auctioneers in the dental surgery above the old sale room. If you're in for a checkup, look out for the speaking tube in the wall. That used to link the sale room with the offices above. Ronnie Ski will tell us about Leslie and Leslie. The, the most f of furniture that passed through our hands uh, was general household furniture, uh, modern furniture, antique furniture, china, glassware, pictures, silver and brassware, or well, anything that came out of a house really. The lane sales started probably about the early 1950s when Mr. Leslie bought the large building behind the main shop. Uh, this was converted by Bailey's, the Haddington Builders, and uh, one floor was taken out and the sales commenced there. The, the sort of general furniture, sort of rubbishy stuff, was always put out on the lane sales and sold first before anything inside, which was usually antique or modern. The pricier items that uh, passed through the sale room included pictures which which ranged from oh, £1,000 up to £25,000-£30,000 and furniture which there again from £500 up to £8,000, £10,000, £15,000 roughly. The most important customer we had was the, the, the late Queen Mother. She uh, purchased some items from the shop. Uh, not from the auction, but from an antique shop which was on Market Street, which was called the Carlisle Antique Saloon. And she purchased two uh, Torshier stands and one China Jardinier. Well, the items that I wish I'd maybe kept was some form of uh, modern China, maybe made in the 1910 to 1940s, probably Moorcroft or things like that which uh, I've appreciated quite considerably in value. Uh, I know I, set, I sold a, a Miracle of Vase in about 1980 for £1,800. Nowadays it's probably worth about 15000 I think a lot, a lot of items that we sold uh, were probably transported to America and Canada. There was one or two big buyers in Edinburgh who used to buy the bulk of the, the furniture which was all shipped in these days abroad. If you were standing here 200 years ago, you'd be aware of the, the sounds, the sights, and the smells of hot metal, because this was Rose Hall Foundry. 
where hot metal, molten iron, was poured into moulds to make castings of all types. We don't know much about the early products of the foundry, but I expect they would be things that farmers would use, like ploughshares and fittings for some of the many mills that lined the Tyne at that time. This was the real Iron Age. This was a time when iron was like plastic today. It was the most common material. You would have iron pots and pans in your house. If you wished, you could be buried in an iron coffin and have an iron tombstone. There are examples in the county. We don't know much about the early foundry owners until 1830, when we read about two brothers, the Halliday brothers, who came from England and ran the foundry for some time. They were described as ingenious mechanics, and one of them, Andrew Halliday, entirely self-taught, built a steam engine, a successful steam engine. Thomas Halliday from 1850 owned the business, and he really built it up to probably its maximum size. He was employing 13 men and one boy. These included millwrights, blacksmiths, foundry workers, but also the new profession of engineer. And engineering is part of the business that became more and more important as we look into the history of Rose Hall Foundry. Thomas was quite an entrepreneur. He produced for the Haddington Agricultural Show. He exhibited threshing machines, reaping machines, stationary steam engines. These were engines that you could run all sorts of farm machinery from, as well as smaller items like turnip pulpers and straw cutters. His customers weren't just in East Lothian. He built for the Earl of Durham what was described as the largest and most powerful steam engine ever built in the county. Sadly, we can't find any of the products of his foundry apart from the sluice gates in the mill laid by the Tyne. So next time you walk by the Tyne of an evening, spare a thought for Thomas Halliday. He went bankrupt in 1886. This was the result of depression in agriculture. And it's ironic that that depression in part was caused by imports of cheap wheat from the Americas and from Canada. And that was made possible by the iron rails that brought the wheat to the port and the iron ships that brought the wheat to Britain. Going into the 20th century, the new owners, Stevenson and Binney, in 1911, advertised that they had a motor mechanic who could do all sorts of repairs to motor cars and motorcycles. He could adjust magnetos and carburetors. He could even vulcanize tires. David Stevenson, whose house survives as, as part of Rose Hall stores, was the manager of the, uh, and chief engineer of Rose Hall foundry up until the 1950s, and he continued to produce agricultural machinery, but at the same time, the foundry made wrought iron goods. So some of the railings, the gates around Haddington, will be products of this foundry. He also made metal bridges. At some time before the 70s, the flames went out in the foundry, and production, continuous production, which had lasted for 150 years, came to an end. In 1984, the foundry was demolished and the buildings on the site, the houses here, were constructed. A new business came to Haddington in 1913, the Kilspindy Hosiery Company. They bought the old premises of the Carlisle Hotel. At first they were a wholesaler, trading in hosiery, outerwear and underwear. You could buy from Kilspindy a box of comforts to send to the troops in the trenches, including socks. In 1919, they started to manufacture their own products. They made boys' school socks, gents' golfing socks and kilt socks with argyle checks. 
ladies full hosiery. During the war, they produced stockings for wear with sea boots for the Navy. After the war, they used the same machines to produce their famous fisher knit sweaters. In the 50s and 60s, they expanded behind the old hotel into what is now Tesco's. At their peak, they employed 350 people, many of whom were women. They were the largest employer in town. They provided skilled work for knitters, for salespeople, for engineers, for clerical staff. But working at Kilspendi wasn't simply about the work. It was a community in itself. There were sporting activities. There was even a ladies football team at one time. When a woman got married, her co-workers would give her a great send-off. Mill picnics were occasions for the whole family. There were more formal do's, like the mill dance. As a result of a series of unfortunate takeovers, Kilspindy came to an end in 1989. Well, I started in 1961, left the school at 15. I went into the Hanflat department you know, to learn about knitting, how to form stitches and things. And after a couple of years, I moved into the what they called the power machines in these days. Um, and I was a couple of years at that, roughly. And then uh, I moved into the mechanics workshop, where you, you learn to repair machines and you know all types of machines, knit machines, iron makeup machines. Uh, the first time I was in Kilspindy was uh, when I was 23, which is 60 years ago. And I worked in M department, which was a merchandising department of Kilspindy. They had two departments, uh, the factory warehouse and the merchandising warehouse, F department and M department. Uh, I actually left Kospindy around about when I was 22 and I went through to Cope Bridge in uh, Lanarkshire for a couple of years. Um, I learned a lot more, I went to a bigger company and lucky enough I got to go back to Harrington. A couple of years later after that again, and then I had quite a, a nice career there until unfortunately uh, in 1989 that uh, things went wrong, finally. So. And many, many years later, I was working in a steel mill along the road, and um, there was an advert in the paper looking for a yarn storeman, uh, which I decided I would like to do, because I was in a job that uh, I didn't like. So I started there again. And then I worked 10 years uh, in the yarn store. I took over the yarn store, running of it, uh, some of the yarn buying, eventually production control as well, uh, in various ways, tied it all up. Well, the hours were uh, five to eight, yes. Uh, and also there was night shifts going on as well at Cospindy. They were running virtually 24 hours a day for quite a number of years. There was quite a lot of knitting done at one time, yeah. In the warehouse the first time, you know, there were about uh, seven of us in the M department warehouse. And of course I had the mechanics who were men, uh, the hand machine, hand flat girls, uh, well, it must have been about 40 odd at one time. Yeah, when you, you enjoy Cospindy, you'd consider it being a, a job for life, yes. In these days, yeah. And it was for quite a lot of people, you know, they remember many retirements. Stefan will remember them well as well. You know, there was a few guys had been there the 50 years, which is, I mean, nowadays that's virtually, it's unknown. You know. Cospindy was an important employer in Harrington, one of the main employers. In fact, I would think probably the main employer in Harrington. There's also quite a good social side of Cospindy, maybe at times that kind of fell through, you know. Annual dances and things, it was quite nice. And we used to have golf, golf tournaments against the uh, Rankos and Lee Market became quite a bit of rivalry there. Uh, it was good fun. Ian Baird had a lot to do with that. And when I was in the M department, we, uh, the 
one of the sales directors from London used to come, and he was in overall charge of that department. And uh, he used to come up once a year and take, at least take the men out um, for a show uh, to the theatre or somewhere in the Empire and a drink. That was good, once a year. I think he gave the girls a box of chocolates. <laughs> but I'm not sure. That's long ago. The, the, the wages were, I think, were probably the same as, as the borders. I mean, the borders then was... Um, Hoyke especially, there was a tremendous amount of companies in that were in the other time, and I would say Harrington was probably the same, yeah. Salaries, yeah. In the M department, they bought in various garments. Uh, wind cheaters were bought in and never produced on the factory. Uh, things like twin socks that were a special way that had two ways of, two, well, as I say, twins made this uh, different uh, rule or something. And they were wonderful, famous also, but they were all bought in. They made a lot of stockings on their own, but it was stockings, not half hours usually. It was boys' school or girls' school. In fact, they made pullovers and cardigans for Gordonstown, a famous school in the Highlands. Uh, they, were, they had the, the making of them. Beautiful stuff. Uh, Cospin, the, the, the product itself, yes, it was, uh, it, it uh, got, went all over the world, yeah. So it was a popular product. It was, it was a, a garment you could honestly put on, I'm quite sure you, you would have ten years later. Uh, it was a good product, whereas nowadays you'll, you know, you buy a jersey and it's lasting times very little. But, and I think I'm right in saying that uh, Francis Chichester, who sailed around the world, I think that's his name, if it's right, he actually had a Cospindy jersey. Yeah, one of the heavyweight ones of the hand machines. And also, I think it was Rex Harris and My Fair Lady, I think, had a... You'll see him wearing a Renfrew jersey. I became more and more aware of the, over the years, uh, especially towards the end, that there were financial problems in the factory, in the, in the, in the business, um, and gradually we, um, and, and sadly I was involved in part of it, had to sack people in this uh, factory to reduce the costs. And that was a, that was a hell of a time. The year, I can't, I'm not just certain, but the actual uh, computerised machines that came in were, at that time, were Dubé from Switzerland. Uh, the electronic tape type machines, and um, in these days they was you know the most up to date machines you could get. So we got uh, a fair sized plant of them, in and uh, you know people went in courses, etc., to learn you know all about them because it was new technology, and they were fairly successful. Because in the old days at Cotspind, it was more what they called cut and sew. The machinery would knit panels, and then they'd be transferred to makeup department to cut into shape. But the new, the new machinery that came in was uh, computerised, therefore you could shape the garments to size. You know, so there's no waste. Uh, you know, so there was uh, progress in that respect. Eventually, of course, they ran out of money. And they were making losses, quite, quite nasty losses, and they couldn't afford it. One of the reasons that they made losses was inflation was going up like... Uh, I don't know how you would describe it, it was going up and up and up. And the profits, of course, then came down and down and down because you couldn't keep selling it. And that, that was a, one of the main problems, yes. I think what happened there as well, technically, the, the people that took us over took us in a different market for knitwear. And, uh, you know, that was nearly what we were good at. I mean, some of the styles going in the machines then were more midland stuff and, you know, man-made fibres rather than wool which Cospindy was never really into that. They bought in a computer to do various organising of the machinery, uh, production, uh, yarn buying and so on. And uh, my own opinion was that's what ruined Cospindy. Because the people who sold the computers and the people who wanted the use of them didn't really get together properly. 
the questions uh, the computer people asked to how to program it uh, didn't mean anything very much to the people in the place. And what they wanted in the place didn't really communicate itself to the programmers. Well, I really enjoyed my time there. It's ups and downs, a lot of good people and a lot of good fun. A lot of hilarity and it was fun in these days. Um, no, and that's the truth of the matter, really. Nowadays it's different, it's more of a rat race. But it was more of a family company, I think, and uh, there's quite a lot of rivalry and things, and uh, it was good fun. What's that sound from bygone days, as my memories travel back in time, of a building full of life and creation, a fabric of people linked by a line? Machines that would chatter all day, spinning yarns of what had to be, man and woman inspiring their path. Mark their cards to a style degree. Wool fluff that spread to all corners, an aroma of grease and yarn oil. The watchful eye of the skillful knitter, listening to hear a sound to spoil. Working people from county wide, human banter, some fun, some profound. A sense of human companionship, filtered in an air, confused in sound. But alas, these were the days of commerce where quality maintained its name. Known at all the world's compass points, Colspindy, Hannington, in history, remains Peter M. McCulloch. Thank you very much. It's appropriate that we end our programme at the former premises of the Courier. The Courier has served as a record of our community for more than 150 years. It was founded in 1859, and in these days was called the Haddingtonshire Courier. The front page was entirely advertisements, and of course, there were no photographs at that time. The Courier was printed here, but also many other publications, the minutes of the East Lothian Council and of the Presbytery. You could have wedding invitations printed here, even cinema posters, Preston Pan Cinema each week had its poster printed by the Courier. You may have been one of the school children on a trip to the Courier who was lucky enough to have his, his or her name spelt out in hot metal by a linotype operator. You may have bought one of the hundreds of school photographs that they published. Three former workers of the Courier will tell us more about it. John Wood, Stuart Galloway, and George Cunningham. The Courier was founded in October 1859 by one of the Kroll brothers. Even when I started work, uh, Miss Kroll, um, the granddaughter of one of the founders, was, was still alive. But Mrs Kroll, her mother, uh, was, was active in, in the firm when I started. Well, I started actually just towards the end of 1951 and I got a job as a message boy, but I officially started in April 1952. I left the Courier in the year 2000, so it was just about 50 years. Well, I actually started working at the Courier uh, when I was 12 year old running messages from the school. But I had done that for two years and I, I started in the Courier actually in 1952. Um, you then, at that particular time, you served seven years apprenticeship. And I was on the machine side, what they call letterpress machinemen. I started working in the Courier in July 1961, and I finished in December 2004. I was a printer, a letterpress machineman. We printed all kinds of commercial work, and uh, plus the newspaper as well. The, uh Compositors would set various jobs for us to do and we would receive them and put them on the machine and they were in a large, what they called chases, um, which was a large metal frame and all the handset uh, posters and such like were enclosed in these and we put them onto what they call a flatbed machine in which uh, they rotated back and forward, they had a large cylinder and we hand fed the sheets of paper through these machines. Well I started off as a message boy, you know, which you did for about a year or so, 
and I became an apprentice compositor. And after that, we became linotype operators. The linotype operator actually set the, the print in type. It was a, produced a, a line of type in hot metal. And these lines were put together to make up the pages of the courier. It was a Wednesday we started on the courier. And uh, we printed one side of the courier, four pages. And it was all hand fed. And I think at that time we, we hand fed about 8,000 sheets. And the fray, the chases came down for the next four pages of the courier. And they were hoisted down on a chain through a hole in the floor. And uh, they were lifted onto the machine. They weighed about, something I remember, just over half a hundred weight, something like that. And uh, you had to be careful because there was enough, some of it was hand set, but the majority of it was linotype set. And uh, these were laid on the, on the bed of the machine and we printed the other side. Now, if we were fortunate, you'd maybe get started about six o'clock on the Thursday night. And uh, you would be printing them through, you know, possibly work through to maybe one, half past one in the morning something that's later. It depends because the machines were belt driven and if these belts stayed on or didn't break, which often happened, then you would get a good run through, what we would call a clean run through. Once the, 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 the couriers came off the machine, they were then passed over to a large folder whereby there was somebody sitting in a folder and folded all the papers and they were taken off uh, by uh, old Johnny Wood, as we used to call him, and he would uh, tie them up and all the various news agents uh, would get their, their papers delivered the next morning. Well, when I, when I started in the Courier, it was, the paper was printed in flat sheets, uh, 32 inches by 42 inches. Um, it was hand-fed into the presses, but then um, when we got the Gus, Rotary Press, it made a big difference and the paper was printed quicker. Um, it gave us more time for doing printing commercial work as well. It was a, a huge part of the profit and the, the more time there was to do commercial work, the, the more um, profits would be made because the, the, the jobs, as time went on, got bigger and bigger. We went into doing some magazines printing books and uh, lots of big things like that. And then it went, and then latterly, it went into colour printing. So it was very important. Now, there was a Goss Rotary Press, they called it. Now that machine had to be dismantled at Dunfermline, which took three months to dismantle. Then it was transported through here, and it was then another three months to rebuild it. Oh, the machine was, uh, it was huge and uh, it certainly made a difference to the printing of the courier. We could uh, print a paper in under three hours at Latterly. It was, um, it was a good press. Although, although, although it was old, it was built, it built in 1908. Um, so it was still going strong after all these years. The reels were quite big, they weighed about 600 weight. And uh, we're running two reels on the press at the same time. You could get 6,000 papers from a reel. It was worked out um, that if a, roll, a reel was rolled out, it would stretch from Haddington to Trinent, about six miles or six and a half miles. That particular machine uh, made a big difference to the, uh, the running time uh, for the courier. And plus you had more pages. Um, because you could go to up to a 32 page. Once we had finished uh, all the printing at the Courier and when we finished the, the place closed down, the Goss Press was taken away by a museum in France uh, where it was taken for show in a huge printing museum south of Paris. The centenary of the Courier took place in 1959 and to celebrate it, um, all the staff and all the correspondents who sent in news uh, around East Lothian uh, gathered in the George Hotel for a centenary dinner. 
and Mrs Crow was present on that occasion. And everything was free, even to the extent of cigarettes on the table for the men to smoke, and the ladies. <laughs> well, there'd be about, I'm just trying to think, there might be about a dozen on the work side when I started, but when I left, you know, there was the, the staff had doubled in size, actually. It was a busy little office, really. You know, most people were kept, kept going most of the time. There weren't many slack spells. It was enjoyable at the time I was there. Um, all the, the staff uh, knew each other well, and uh, it was just partly a big family at that particular time. And uh, I certainly enjoyed the years I was there. I enjoyed my time very much. It was a it was a good job. Um, a lot of work beside a lot of good people, and it was just like a a family. Um, and the, a lot of the older guys, the more experienced guys, sort of looked after us younger guys, especially when I was an apprentice. We've made this programme not as a lament for the past, but as a record for the future of how people in this town earn their living. For me, one of the things that links these very different businesses is the level of skill required of the workers the skill of the seedsman, of the entarsha knitter, of the compositor. The way we are now living now has changed. Machines do some of the thinking for us. Many things have improved. We no longer work in sturdy seed lofts or dusty flour mills. New industries have taken the place of the old. But this community is still thriving. Haddington is very much in business still.